All right. Well, maybe we should remind people that the meeting's being recorded. Paul Bachelman is here. All right. And so is Risha. Uh, promote to panelist. All right. Okay, here they both come. Hey, Risha, Paul, you made it. <clears throat> oh, do we have to unmute I, them? I no, did. No. They can unmute themselves. Jessica Allen is still, we'll leave her there for the moment. Hello, Jessica. We're going to try to get the whole trust here and then we'll invite you in. <clears throat> As usual, I'm finishing up dinner, so I'm going to turn the video off for the next few minutes. <laughs> That's okay. I did that in a great rush just a few minutes ago. So I think we should bring food for all of us. I think that's the only fair thing to do. There you go. Well, if we meet in person, <laughs> I'm willing to. <laughs> when we have our strategic planning thing. Yeah. yeah. There is Allegra. Allegra is on her way. Here is Allegra. Hello, Allegra. Hello. Welcome. Hi. I was getting some weird um when I was pressing to click in, I was saying like I'm I had to join as the host and I it, I don't know. <laughs> some so I don't know if people are having that same difficulty, but I was confused. Huh, I don't know. Well, it, Nate's not here, so a different person who I don't even know really. Steve McCarthy, is it, who set mm -hmm. this up for us? And uh, he's actually, I think he's gone. I don't know if he's around. Here's Rob. Looks like he, looks like he made you host and then took off. Yeah, that's what he yeah, did. Yeah, he said we could email him if there's a problem. But I don't know his email, so actually. No, I'm I do. Not, we get the email. Good. I get the email, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I, we're not going to have a problem, that's all. Nope. Ha, nope. Ha, ha. We hope, anyways. Okay, here's Rob. Hi, Rob. So there are five of six of us here. Let's no one said they weren't. The only person who said they might not come was Paul, and he was here first. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Things change. So, yeah. So we're waiting for Grover and for Ashley. Yes, Grover and Ashley. Yep. And we'll, I believe we have a quorum, however, so we'll wait. It's only 7.01. We'll wait a little bit more, and then we'll just start and add them when they come, if they come. Okay, since you're going to start, I'll add them. Okay, well, I'm we, going to wait we a couple start. more minutes. Absolutely. Okay, do, we, do, do we have a quorum? One, two, three, four, five. Oh, we do. Six. Six. We're all, yeah, six. Six of us. Six. So we have a quorum. <clears throat> so I think perhaps that means we'll call the meeting to order at 7.02 and uh, welcome everyone who is here. Um, Rob has agreed to take notes for us tonight. Thank you so much, Rob, because George is somewhere else and can't do it this time. Um, so that's where we are. Uh, does anyone, hopefully everyone got to see the July minutes. Are there any questions, concerns, or comments or anything about the July minutes? Rob? It looks like George gave me partial credit for doing them. Um, that should be deleted. <laughs> what should be deleted? I'm sorry. At the bottom, it says um, by George and, and me, but it's only by George. Oh, okay. All right. We will we'll do that. Delete delete the part that said by Rob. And here is Grover. Welcome, Grover. Uh, are there any other thoughts about the minutes? Grover, we kind of started and we're looking at the minutes. And we're seeing if there are any concerns. The only one was Rob. Noticed at the bottom it said they were by George and and Rob, and Rob said, they're by George, so we'll take him off and he'll do them for us this time. Any other concerns or thoughts? Ashley just joined us. Ashley, we're doing minutes. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so we're all here. Fantastic. Uh, 
are there if there are no other questions about the about questions about the comments questions about the minutes i will assume unless i see something or hear something to the contrary that the minutes have been approved the minutes look good everybody agree i know no one can see the fact that we're raising our thumbs but we are i hear i hear no objection so the July minutes have been approved as amended, the amendment being removal of Rob's name. All right. So our next item of interest is uh, to hear from Jessica. And it looks like Laura is also here. So we will promote them. Can you, you want to bring them in, Erica? Yes, I'll bring them in. Uh, they so. are going to let us know how the ball lane project is going and they have a proposal that I hope that presumably we've all read a request for $375,000 I believe it is to make ball lane work. So they are panelists. welcome both of you. Welcome Jessica. Welcome Laura. You should be able to unmute yourselves. Thank you. And um, I had a question for you. I think that I could share your slides, but if you would like to, I would happily make one of you a co-host and be much happier than doing it myself. That's fine. <clears throat> if you wouldn't mind making me a co-host, then I can uh, I can show the slides. And I will do that right <laughs> now. Okay. I I'm going to apologize in advance that I have a puppy outside my door, like fairly <laughs> new, and I am the mama, so he may start barking at some point during the meeting. So just giving you a heads up that you could hear some some racket behind me. He doesn't like Fair enough. me. <laughs> Fair so. enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. Oh, goodness. Okay, well, All why right. don't you go ahead and uh, do your proposal? Let us know whether you would like us to ask questions along the way at the end, or what do you want? Yeah, I think we can. you can ask questions along the way. Um, can you see a um, presentation in a PDF? I'm going to try to make it a full view here. Yes. Yes, I can see it in okay. a PDF. And perfect. There perfect. you go. Now it's a Great. full view. Great. Perfect. Um, so my name is Jessica Allen. I am a real estate project manager with Valley CDC. Um, Laura is also here with me and she's the director of our division for real estate. And um, I'm going to give you a briefing tonight and answer any questions on the application we've submitted to the trust for the Amherst Community Homes. Um, I do want to note we're making a slight name change from the Ball Lane Community Homes to Amherst Community Homes. And that has mostly to do with the fact that there's no access to this property off of Ball Lane in our <laughs> current design. And so um, to keep public safety from being confused, we're shifting the name from Ball Lane um, to Amherst Community Homes. We'll, we'll give it a proper name at some point. We're still kind of hashing out what that name might be. But um, for right now, we're changing the name and the application to the ZBA will be for Amherst Community Homes. So just wanted to note the name shift since our last meeting. So we gave a presentation in September of last year um, to the trust on the on this proposed development. And there are some, some shifts and some changes. So I want to point that out as we go through the slides here. Um, in essence, the project has essentially stayed the same, but there has been some modifications. So I want to make sure that the trust is aware of that from what we presented about a year ago. So I know many of you have attended the numerous um, community sessions that we've had on this project, but for those of you who have not had the opportunity to be able to do so, I do want to give a background on, um, on the site and this project. So we are looking at a parcel that is located in North Amherst. It is... Um, right at the intersection of Pulpit Hill Road and Montague Road. It's about a nine acre site. It's in a fabulous location in terms of our um, real estate development opinion because it is so close to so many different things and has a lot of opportunity to access to parks and housing and services. 
So I think one of the key things, and I will highlight this a little bit more later in the presentation, why this is important, is that this parcel is located in the North Amherst um, QCT, Qualified Census Tract. This is a HUD designated um, census tract um, based on population and socioeconomic um, data. So this is, this is key for this project in terms of how we're able to, to access public funding that it's located in the QCT. Um, it is right on the PVT Route 33. There's a bus stop that's right here adjacent to the corner of the site. So that's fantastic in terms of public access. Um, we're located near um, Puffer's Pond, near the Mill River Recreation Area. The Pioneer Valley co-housing is right up the street. Um, we also are near the uh, Survival Center. Um, near the um, Mills District. So we are near a lot of goods and services for these future homeowners, which is awesome. Um, the site is also located about one and a half miles from UMass and UMass can be reached on the, on, the, on the bus route. So again, a fabulous location for anybody who might be looking to live here. Um, for us, for our purposes, you know, we've got two public ways. We've got Pulpit Hill and Montague Road. And as I noted, there's also Ball Lane, which is a private way. And um, for a variety of reasons, due to legal constraints in terms of access and the fact that it is a private way, we've really shifted from trying to access the site from this private lane and trying to focus our access from the public ways. Um, this site was previously developed. It was um, a former trucking facility, an agricultural facility. Um, there are buildings that used to be there that are now demolished. They were, um, were demolished about a year and a half, two years ago. Um, now we've just got some concrete slabs there. So it is a previously developed site. Um, there does remain an existing house. It's about an 800 square foot house and we are we have a tenant who lives there so we are renting it out to um, to somebody who's been there for a long time. She was she she's was there before we purchased the property so same tenant has been there for several years. Um, and we do have some wetland constraints on the site that we are very um, cognizant of as we're moving forward with our design process. So we have a small drainage ditch that's up here on this uh, right along Pulpit Hill Road that's wetlands and so we're avoiding that. And there's also this lovely riparian area with wetlands back here towards the southern part of the site. So that's kind of an overview of its location and just some of the characteristics of the property itself. Um, we think it's a beautiful site. I know others that have come to the site also when they've walked it, it is beautiful. It has gorgeous views to the west. Um, this picture here is standing from that back riparian corner and looking down towards the intersection. So you'll see some houses there, but it's a you know wide open field with some rolling topography. Um, this is looking from the intersection back. And then as I noted there, you know, it's previously developed. So there's concrete slabs, there's an access driveway coming off Montague Road, and this is a photo of the existing house. So one of the main goals of this project is to provide first time home buyers um, with um, access to, to new homes. And so the, the main funding source that we are looking to utilize in this development is the Commonwealth Builder Program. Um, this is a fairly new program. It's been around for a couple of years, um, and it is, as far as we know, and as far as I know, the only state public subsidy for affordable home ownership. Most of the money that's out there that's in public subsidies is for rental. So it is very rare to, um, to have this program and to have it available. And um, one of the goals of the Commonwealth Builder Program is not only to increase first-time home buyers, but really to increase um, BIPOC understanding that there is a huge gap between Black homeowners and white homeowners, understanding that as individuals in America, most of our individual wealth is held in our house. And for hundreds of years with multiple policies, whether it's land use and zoning that have, um, that have restricted home ownership, um, whether it's lending policies, um, whether it's appraisal bias, there has been multiple systematic um, problems that have prohibited from Black homeowners from owning a home. And so one of the program goals through the Commonwealth Builder Program is to increase um, BIPOC home ownership. And this is this is reached through um, the deed writers and some of the lottery preference. And I'll, I'll get into those details later on, but that is one of the main goals of this program. 
So here is the latest and greatest for the proposed development. Um, as many of you know, we are deep in the weeds of design development right now, and our hope is to file um, permits within the next month to the Zoning Board of Appeals. But this is the latest and greatest, and we're still kind of hashing things out. But in general, the concept hasn't changed all that much since you saw it about a year ago. Um, we're still looking to do 30 homes, um, 15 duplexes. Um, and I will note that the one major change since we saw you in September is that we've kind of changed the affordability mix. So when we came to you last year, um, we were looking to do 10 homes at market rate. Mm -hmm. um, we had a market study that was completed at the end of last year that indicated that we would not be able to sell the homes at the price that we were pricing them at. Um, a price that we needed to set due to the high construction cost. And so the market wouldn't support that. Even though Amherst has a really high housing market compared to the rest of the Valley, we still wouldn't be able to sell the homes at what they would cost to construct. So we went back to Commonwealth Builders and we've been talking with them back and forth about what's the best way to make use of their subsidy and um, what's the best unit mix to, to be able to get the most money into the deal from Commonwealth Builders. And so from there, we have now an all affordable um, development and we are setting the, the household AMIs at 80% and 100% AMI. And I'll give some more data about what that means in a slide or two. Carol, you had, I saw you raised your hand. Did you have a question? Oh, yeah, I just wondered if you could give us a hand of what was the thing, you, what was the amount you were trying to sell them for that you discovered was too much? What was that amount? I'm I'd just curious. Go, I'd have to go back and look, but I believe they were over 500 for the market. Okay. Okay. They were pretty, Thank you. They were pretty high. Yeah. And, you know, the construction pricing is just so cuckoo bananas right now that we would be taking a subsidy. We'd be taking a hit trying to sell them at market rate. And that doesn't seem to make sense. So um, so by this way, we're able to get public subsidy. We're able to 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 make the numbers work. Um, so from the site design perspective, we're really trying to concentrate the development where we've already previously developed. Um, we're trying to preserve that beautiful field in that frontage right on Pulpit Hill and Montague Road. Um, the idea is to have clusters of little neighborhoods with access to open space. So you'll see that there's these little pocket parts that are part of the design um, and really preserving this, this area here. So about half of the property will be developed and the other half will be protected as open space. Um, looking to have this be a very pedestrian friendly development. So parking comes in, we have two shared parking areas and the rest of these are all pedestrian pathways. So the idea is to have a main pedestrian pathway spine with the majority of the homes fronting that pedestrian pathway and then these secondary pathways that connect these little neighborhoods together. Um, we do intend to have dedicated EV parking spaces um, in this development. We're still working out the numbers, but I think we'll have six to start with the possibility of increasing to 11 over time. Um, the building design. So again, trying to utilize the um, the, the site and all of the benefits of the site, this open site that can really utilize PV solar. Um, we're looking to have a passive solar oriented buildings. So that means that the buildings are designed so they have a lot of windows on the Southern side, less windows on the Northern side, um, really trying to utilize the sun to help regulate the heating and cooling within the home based on the time of year. Um, we're looking to have all electric utilities, so no fossil fuels to be used. Um, the homes are small. The, the idea is that they are, you know, this is a concentrated development with small footprints. So um, the smaller homes starting at around 995 square feet and the larger three bedroom homes getting as high as 1273. Carol, I saw you raise your hand again. Yeah, I'm sorry. I just wonder no, if, you have, if you have the parking out there, what kind of, uh what happens if for somebody with disabilities are there any accommodations made for people that might have disabilities sure so these buildings that have um that have c's on them they have a uh one the so there's three there's three different building types one is a one story two bedroom then we have a one and a half story 
um, two bedroom and then a two story, three bedroom. So the one story are designed to be accessible. So those would be six homes. Those homes are being placed, um, they're the C and the D units. So they are being placed closest to My the God. parking areas and so that they have um, the easiest access. The other benefit of placing homes in those location, and this is, was a specific request of the abutter here, is that having a ground floor um, prevents like a second floor looking into his yard. So between the screening and the fencing and having a low building on this side, um, you know, that helps with the with the abutters as well and their concerns with feeling uh, an invasion of privacy from from new homes being there. I see two more hands and I don't know who wants to go first. So I'll leave it to Carol to, to call on members. <laughs> I see Ashley's, Ashley's hand first. In, first in my little thing. So go Ashley. Um, well, hope maybe you're getting to it, but then how much is each unit going to cost? And is there a subsidy even for the tenant of that cost? So I'll get to the pricing um, soon. I have a slide that kind of details all that. Do you mind waiting a few minutes? Oh, yeah, that's okay. Okay, great. Okay, Grover. Yeah, my question is also about access and design. So my memory of this area is that there's not existing sidewalks at, on the lot here, but there is a bus stop out there. So if somebody was a wheelchair user or like a child, um, and wasn't going to drive off the property, but wanted to go to the bus stop, is there going to be some kind of a pedestrian path that's safe that doesn't require people to walk on the road to get to the bus stop? Yep. So what, how we've designed this is that there is going to be a pedestrian way that goes down here, and then we're adding a sidewalk on this side. There is an existing sidewalk on this side, but we are proposing to add a sidewalk on, on our property. And then you know, we don't have plans to put in a crosswalk, um, but maybe that's something that the town would be willing to contribute to the project is to to put the a painted crosswalk from the sidewalk location over to the bus stop. Any other questions about design before I move on? No? Okay. Oh, Allegra? Um. I was just wondering how the two bedroom and three bedroom split came up. And I'm asking specifically because we had our um, listening session back in June and something that I heard from the people that were in my group was that finding a three bedroom is particularly hard mm -hmm. at this point. Mm -hmm. um, we came up with this split because I think, you know, that we were responding to what we believe the market was asking for at the time. Um, so, um, and I think also trying to keep the pricing as low as possible. Uh, Commonwealth builders will allow um, under their regulations, they're trying, they would like to, and I do have this in a slide later on, but they do like to try to match up the number of people to the number of bedrooms plus one. So a three family, uh, a three person household would, um, could go into a two bedroom or a four person um, household would be able to go into a three bedroom. Okay, I'm gonna keep going here. So here's our proposed building design and this is just some renderings of what some of the different units look like. So we've got, as I noted, three different or four different building types. Um, this is building type A, which has a one and a half story, two bedroom on one side and the two story, three bedroom on the other side. You'll see that there's a lot of windows on this one because this has a southern entrance. Um, this is building type B. So this has one and a half story on this side and two bedroom on this side. However, the window configuration is a little bit different on, on this entrance side because it's on the north. Um, the building type C, this is a one and a half story, two bedroom and the one story, two bedroom. And then the building type D, two story, three bedroom, and then the one story, two bedroom. So this is our building renderings. And um, as part of the application, I did provide you with the full set of building plans with the floor plans and, and whatnot. So you can really dig mm -hmm. into those plans if, if you want to when you're um, as part of your application. So let's talk about the anticipated sale prices. So 
final sale prices are going to be set by mass housing and they have they utilize um the hud household income um levels to set what some of those income levels will be and then they've got very specific calculations on how they get to where they believe those anticipated sale prices are going to be so this is what the numbers are as of today i cannot guarantee that this is what the numbers are going to be once we get to the sale of homes within a couple of years it's going to depend on hud income levels and how those change it's going to depend on a whole number of factors so as of right now this is where we're looking for anticipated sale prices for the 80 percent household ami two bedroom one story nine five square footage building we're looking at anticipated sales price of about 150,000 and then the ranges go up and the highest price point is a three bedroom two story um, for the 100 percent AMI at 232,000 so the ranges as of right now are about 150,000 to 232,000. And uh, for income eligible up oh, Ashley you had a well, so affordable housing, according to, you know, the law is 80% AMI. So actually half the units are actually considered affordable housing and half are not because 100% AMI is not affordable housing. Okay, thank you. Is that is that true? I mean, so I'll, I'll jump in. I, I think okay. there's a little. Um, so for CPA funds, they fund up to 100% AMI, which is the funding that the trust works with. Okay, because that, I mean, obviously, we talk a lot and debate about what is affordable, but yep. I always thought the, the law in, no. you know, it was 80. <laughs> so <laughs> the, town's, the town's own definition of affordable housing is 80%, but your own CPA program, which is part of a wider state program, has a higher threshold. And it's typical that for home ownership, you might see these higher thresholds than you would for rental housing. It's a different demographic. Um, and so I would just say it's, it's compatible with the funding that the trust has been given. Um, it's also true that if you use a 40B zoning permit, all of the units will be counted on your subsidized housing inventory. Okay, well, that's, it's interesting. And then also, we should just note that, you know, if it's counted, we're counting all the units, not just the half that actually is Amherst affordable housing. Right. And it's really important for people to understand that because a development like north square which is mostly market rate all of those units are on the subsidized housing inventory that's right even that's though only a small fraction of them are affordably restricted units so yeah 20 per, very I know important 20, thing to 20 keep in mind yeah yeah carol you had another question well i just wonder this sometimes i've heard people say okay I can only have 80% AMI to buy this house, but I need to have whatever one of these things here to buy this house. Are you concerned that there's that you might not have enough people eligible within whatever that window is? Like, I can't earn more than this, but I have to earn this much in order to get a mortgage. And is there enough space in there? Sure. So I've got a slide on that um, in two slides. Okay. Yeah. All right, great. <laughs> okay. You guys are just so on top of it. <laughs> Um, so let's see what's next. Uh, so this is this is just numbers set by mass housing to understand the household size and what those income levels are again at this point in time and in this moment in time. So two person household earning 63.8 um, ranging up to a four person household earning 79.7. And for the 100% income, two person at 75,000, ranging to about 93,000 for a person household. And as I noted before, per mass housing, the preference will be given to households containing the number of members that are equal to the number of bedrooms plus one. So right, a three right, person right. household can go into a two bedroom. Right, um, or, or larger as well. So as it's well. not that you have to have three people in a two bedroom, you right. have four or five people also. 
Okay, here's the window that you were talking about. Um, so this is just, I grabbed this as an example. This is um, some of the mass housing numbers and they like to do, they like to set the pricing at kind of like a worst case scenario of like, if nobody, if somebody had very little down payment, if they got a mortgage um, that required a PMI. So there's definitely some flexibility here in terms of somebody's ability to purchase a home. So, um, you know, you take the sales price of about 150. This is the two bedroom, one story at 80% AMI. Now for the Commonwealth builders, you're only required to put down 3% for down payment. But again, mass housing likes to do the calculation looking at a 5%. Um, so they add the 5% down payment, depending um, current mortgage rates at the time that we were working out these numbers, it was 6.85. So um, looking at your monthly payment, PMI, taxes, insurance, and the condo fee puts a monthly housing cost of around $1,500. Um, the minimum necessary income that you can have to afford this, if, if you take 30% of that, is $61,000, which doesn't leave a huge window. You'll see up here, there's not a huge window. But like I noted, there's a lot of variability here and ways to sort of open the window. So if somebody has a larger down payment or they utilize down payment assistance that's offered through the community or through the reparations committee, um, you know, that's one way to bring down that mortgage amount. Um, we don't know where lower, where interest rates are going to be in two years. They may be dropping. We may not be at 6.8% in two years. So that will have an impact on somebody's ability to buy. Um, there's a lot of mortgage programs specifically through mass housing that don't require um, somebody to have a PMI. So again, that's another way it's to sort of bring that payment down. Um, looking at mortgages that allow 33 to 35% for gross monthly housing income rather than the 30% that mass housing is modeling. And then a larger household with a larger income eligibility would be able to, again, have that um, ability to, to sort of open that window. So Carol, does that answer some of your questions in terms of what you were wondering about? It does. I mean, what I don't know is like, and, and I don't suppose probably anybody does, but if anybody has any sense of, because you said you did a market study and you knew you couldn't sell things at $500,000. Did the market study give you some idea that there would be enough people to sell these given this bunch of stuff that you figured out? I guess that's oh, yeah. my question. Oh yeah, there's there's plenty of opportunity. So the market said okay. the affordable units said there would be no problem um, selling these um, these homes at this amount. I mean, this is way below what the market is right now in Amherst. Way below. Yeah, so, that, that's clear. It's yeah. just the it's the income, you know, because of the affordability, because of the AMI requirements. It's like sure, you can only sure. go up so far. Anyway, thank you very much. Sure. Yep. Um, I don't know who was first, Allegra or Ashley. So Ashley. Ashley. Well, so I have looked at the market um, in lots of other towns, and I just want to put in that between 150,000 and 2,000 is what condos and very small houses in almost every other town but Amherst around us, Holyoke, Chicopee. You know, if you just don't live in Amherst, this is exactly what you get or a tiny bit below. So in the next two years, I mean, this won't be done for two years. There'll be many, many people who will buy houses at this exact rate with no subsidy in lots of other, all the other towns, more or less. Mm -hmm. If somebody chooses the market to, rate. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think I think what Amherst has is it has a, a um, you know wonderful reputation with its school system. It has a wonderful reputation with community, and I think that. That drives the market. That's why the pricing is so high in Amherst now is that it's a desirable location for people to be. I'm not saying Chicopee is not a desirable place for somebody to be, but if they've got family and some of the individuals that I've talked to that are trying to stay near their family are looking to buy here in, in Amherst because they want to they want to be within uh, close distance to their to the relatives. So it's something for somebody to consider. Allegra, yeah, you had a question? Um, I am just looking at this calculation and to me, the taxes look kind of low. Is there any sort of like 
how how does the tax structure work there? So that was based off of Amherst tax amount. I can go back and double check it, but um, I believe it was, I can't remember, 21 something, 2127, 2721. So the taxes are set based on this affordable value because the uh, units are encumbered with a deed restriction, okay. which diminishes their market value. So even though on an open market, these would be worth more, one of the beauties of this system though, is the people who buy them will pay taxes on this affordable sales price. Okay. Right. That's probably why they look low. <laughs> yeah, I was like, that looks reasonable. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's great. <laughs> that's also monthly. Yes, and even okay. so, it looks reasonable. Okay, okay. <laughs> oh my god! Any more questions before I move on? No. So the taxes for the year are twelve times two hundred and sixty-six dollars. Correct. Oh, dollars. this is yeah. This is this is monthly, monthly housing cost. So this is your monthly mortgage payment and interest. This is your monthly PMI. This is your monthly taxes, monthly insurance, monthly condo fee. Oh. Um, so jumping to Commonwealth Builder and their home buyer requirements. So this, this is the information that's going to be um, part of our regulatory agreement with Commonwealth Builders and Mass Housing. These are the requirements for any of these home buyers. So first and foremost, they must be a first time home buyer as defined under the program. Um, and secondly, they must not have assets. Um, they can have asset, assets less than $100,000. Um, they must have assets less than $100,000. And then they have to qualify income. They have to be able to qualify for a fixed rate mortgage. They have to be able to put a minimum of 3% down or be approved for a down payment assistance program. They have to be able to pay closing costs and they have to complete home ownership counseling by the time of purchase. So those are gonna be the requirements before somebody is gonna be um, granted the ability to purchase one of these um, homes. Um, and these are all requirements under Commonwealth Builder. And um, I did wanna note that Commonwealth Builder when it was first created the program, um, ARPA was not uh, a funding source and this funding program got a pretty big slug of ARPA money. And so these home buyer preferences have been really set and defined as, under the ARPA legislation. Um, so the last slide, they're gonna be requirements. These are gonna be preferences under the lottery. So households living, currently living in a qualified census tract, that's one, and that's important to remember, given the location of the site and that it's in a qualified census tract. And two, households that qualify for certain federal programs that is listed here. So SNAP, um, Head Start, any of those programs, if your household qualify for those federal programs, you'd be given a priority and a preference in the lottery. Allegra? Might be more of a question for Paul, but I saw ARPA and I thought, ARPA. Um, I know that the town still has some funding available, and I just wasn't sure if we were going based on the last slide of $7,500 for a, per, a down payment, if that was the minimum, if that's something that like ARPA funds from the town could potentially be utilized for if they have not expired by that point. Yeah, so we have, I made a presentation to the council about a month ago about ARPA funds and received feedback on that. Uh, this was not part of that uh, request. Um, ARPA funds have to be expended by a certain date, so I'm not sure if the timing will work um, for this project in particular. So I think the CPA approach is really where we probably go. I mean, I think this project is going to receive substantial subsidies as it is, right? Okay, I'm going to move on. Um, so here's a map of the qualified census tracts. There's two of them in Amherst. Um, this district here, the 8203, which is the North Amherst area, and then down here in the 8205. Um, 
I think it's important to note that these are the only qualified census tracts in all of Hampshire County. And so therefore, this is the only eligible area in all of Hampshire County to utilize Commonwealth Builder funds. So you are the envy of a lot of other municipalities. Um, I've had planners from other towns call me and be like, how can we do this? Can you do this here? And I'm like, I'm sorry, but it you don't have the you don't have the right qualified census track. You don't have the right data. It doesn't work for you. So Amherst is in this really unique position to be able to not only have the ability to access these funds for a project, but the fact that we're able to find a site within this qualified census track um, is is awesome. So this really is kind of a unique opportunity here um, to be able to do an affordable home ownership development. Um, in the town of Amherst. So in terms of marketing, we are going to be required by Mass Housing to do an affordable fair housing marketing plan that will be reviewed and approved by Mass Housing. Um, at that time, the Mass Housing will set the market maximum sales prices that we would market under that marketing plan. Um, as I noted, there will be a lottery process. And so folks would put in an application, um, they'd set off, um, we'd make sure that they are uh, meet the, the, the program requirements um, and we would hold that lottery process. There'd be a wait, wait, a wait list that would be maintained by Mass Housing. And then we are required to hire a third party affordable affordability monitoring agent to make sure that we have compliance with the housing marketing plan. So that'll be part of we're required to do. Erica, you have a question? Yes. Um, so when you talk about a marketing plan, it actually has a whole communication aspect to it, outreach aspect to it, because we're talking about individuals who are probably uh, in survival mode. Uh, and then also as part of the application, will there be links to where you can get support for down payments and closing costs? Sure, we can do that as part of the marketing um, process for sure. And what I've been saying for a couple of years now is that um, Anybody who thinks they may be interested in purchasing um, a home should be working now to get their financials in order to make sure they're credit worthy to be able to qualify for, um, for a fixed mortgage. Um, you know, right before you think you're going to be applying for this is not the time to start looking at your finances. You know, really somebody who, who really wants to, to apply for this should be doing that work now. And we at Valley have Donna Cabana, who's awesome, and she does first-time homebuyer assistance and financial literacy. And so um, I've been telling people who have called me and have asked questions about how could they get into this um, one of these homes, what's the lottery process, what's the timeline. I've been directing all of them to Donna and asking them to set up appointments with Donna to make sure that they are going to be in that financial place that they need to be in order to be a first-time homebuyer. Just sort of piggyback on my question. So it seems like your communication plan has to start now. And I'm wondering if there's an opportunity, if there are any, you know, flyers, press releases, et cetera, that we can also help disseminate to, you know, faith-based communities, to different yeah. organizations to start getting individuals prepared for this. That would be awesome. Yeah. Any help that the trust members could provide to connect us with the right people in the community would be amazing. Um, I do have a, a frequently asked questions fact sheet that I did um, and started to disseminate it um, when we had our last community. It was on site. It was in April, I think. Um, so I have something that's already set up and ready to go that I can send the trust members and anybody that you can think of to pass it along to would be awesome. We've done some, we've set it out a little bit when we were holding that community meeting and we handed it out at the meeting as well. Um, but I'm happy to send that to you if you know individuals. And it, it's really about the process of, you know, what's it gonna take to get into one of these places and encouraging people to get their finances in place now, so. Um, okay, restriction terms. So every home, will have a deed restriction. The deed restriction will run for 30 years. Um, this is probably not as long as you're typically used to seeing for, um, for affordability restrictions for our rental projects. Usually we're doing a 99 year restriction term. Um, again, to sort of come back to the fact that really this is to help with providing equity in, um, in a home for somebody to be able to have 
for their individual wealth. So we don't want to tie somebody's hands by setting a restriction term that's really long because the idea is to help people generate that wealth. So the way that the program is currently set up is there's two restrictions that run. One is for years one through 15 that have um, pretty specific restrictions on how the resale price will be determined. It depends on how much work somebody's done in the house, depreciation values, all that stuff mass housing would figure out. And then there's buyer restrictions. Again, it's looking for first time home buyers. It's looking for people who meet those home buyer preferences. Um, years 15 through 30, there's unrestricted um, sales profit that could be made and the buyers are a little bit more flexible, but they're subject to the equity sharing with the public funders. So again, there's a formula and a calculation that depending on how much of a profit somebody would make on that sale, some of that money would have to come back to the public funders. One of them being the town of Amherst is already being a public funder under their CPA. Um, so, um, so that's how it's set up under, under the Commonwealth Builders Program. Um, we may, we've had some discussions, but because we're going under the chapter 40B permitting process, the 80% units may not have this ability to have this sort of split. So we're still hashing that out with mass housing. We wanna to try to make it as equitable as possible, but they really are adamant that we do have for the 100% AMI households having these two um, kind of um, pockets of restrictions, one that runs from years one to 15 and another one that runs from years 15 to 30. The other thing to, that um, is unique to this program is that there's a buy right transfer to immediate family during the term. So if somebody wants to transfer this house to their son or daughter, they want to transfer it um, you know, to a parent, um, they're able to do that, but it must be owner occupied. Nobody can buy these homes and then rent them out. It's, it's completely restricted in the deed restriction to be able to do that. So even if they were to transfer this to an immediate family member, it must still be owner occupied. Um, there is a, a, a right of first refusal that the town has that they can reset the 30 year restriction term if they chose to do so and they must elect to do so. So, um, you know, when the house comes up for sale, there would be some communication from mass housing to the town, notifying them that this house is for sale and giving the town the option to reset the 30 year restriction term if they so choose to do so. And all of resales will be completed by mass housing. There'll be no responsibility on the town of Amherst to, to do any of the paperwork. Mass housing takes the lead on all of the, the um, resales. So let's get into our current budget. So um, we acquired the property, um, what was it? August of 2022, I think now. Um, and um, so we have we have that money that we've utilized. Um, we are estimating construction costs to run around $11 million. It'll be 65% of the budget. Um, all of the other costs that are associated with the project that are necessary, legal, architects, design, environmental, yada, 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 um, that's about 10% of the budget. And then under the Commonwealth Builders Program, we have the ability to um, collect 20% of the total development for overhead and fee. And that fee really is our backup contingency. If anything goes really sideways, that's funds that we use for that um, purpose. And so for our sources, the Commonwealth Builders, um, they are putting in $250,000 per unit, which is about $7.5 million. And then on top of that, they're adding some additional contingency money because the construction pricing is so high. They're actually putting more money in than they're obligated to do under the subsidy. Um, they also have offered to pay for the construction interest over the, over the construction period because it's gonna be running quite high. Um, so they have offered that money as well. So, that so the Commonwealth Builders number is a little bit higher than the typical subsidy amount of what they offer for um, for the 80 and 100% AMI households. Um, We're estimating, again, based on those sale prices that have been provided to us by Mass Housing in our conversations, about $5.9 million for the sales of the homes. Um, we're looking to sell the existing home. The CPA has already committed $750,000, thank you. Um, and we're requesting about $375,000 from the trust. 
We're also looking to, because we're going all electric on these buildings, we're looking to utilize some energy incentive payments. Um, we're looking at a, a couple of grants and foundations to put applications in in 2024. And then Valley will be deferring their developers fees. So um, about half of that. So of that 20%, about half of that's going back into the project to fund the project. So Valley is actually high, putting a higher percentage of money in than we're requesting from the town between the CPA and the housing trust. Our timeline up, oh, Carol, go ahead. Oh, you're on mute, Carol. Sorry. That's uh, okay. I just, I know that whenever we looked at this before, it looked like you were gonna ask the trust for 250. Mm -hmm. And so that's half again as much now. And I just wondered what other things have gone up similarly i mean you just did a great you know you guys are putting in more than you're asking for from us that's pretty significant but i'm just curious uh if if anything else has gone up as well as what you're asking from us sure so initially in the initial budget um i didn't have contracts yet in place for some of the design work so i actually have those contracts in place now and those were higher than we initially anticipated the soft costs have been running higher than we initially anticipated because we've got those contracts in flat place and now we know what the real numbers are um my construction number could still be low we don't really know until we go out and get some pricing and to get some real hard data which i'm hoping to do um after the permit set is is out i'm hoping to talk to some contractors and hopefully they can give us some better numbers to make sure that we're on point um so those are rising high construction costs continue to rise we just don't know where that's going to be um and because of that commonwealth builders is putting in more money than they needed to so um you know and i think initially when we were first presented the overhead um and fee we were we were under the assumption we were only allowed to capture 10%. Um, and we were corrected by Commonwealth Builders program that it could be up to 20. So that's another, that's a little bit of a difference than what was previously shown about a year ago. So that's where the major differences are. Yeah, I think the Commonwealth Builders um, has come to meet us. Um, they've definitely upped their contribution. And I think they're seeing the same thing play out all across the state is that we can't keep up with the construction, the cost of new construction. So they have had to go beyond what their stated program caps are to make these projects work. Calvin, you have a question? Good, let's see, Calvin, you can now talk. Calvin, I believe you can now talk if you unmute yourself. Unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Wonderful. Uh, so a question about the Homeowners Association. Does Valley CDC serve as a property manager post-sale? Do you provide startup funding to the HOA? Is, you know, is 205 a month a reasonable amount to build a fund to pay for capital expenses? Sure. So um, the Commonwealth Builder Program requires that there is a property manager, a third party property manager that is hired as part of um, at the beginning of this. Valley will not be serving that role, but um, we, you know, I think we can definitely help. And my hope is that we will set the condo association up with at least a first time uh, property management company that can assist them. It'll be up to the condo association to really determine whether they want to continue with that property manager in the future. Um, but I definitely think that it is our role to be able to at least set up that um, property manager and at least get the association up and running. Um, you had another question. I'm sorry, I don't remember what it was. I guess it would be uh, you're providing the startup funding, which is good to, you know, to cut the capital expense. I think that was it. And then I guess success level. So having lived in a condo previously, these 20, 30 units, most of the property managing companies want nothing to do with them. Uh, mm -hmm. Or uh, they have a large management fee that's associated. Has your experience been that the associations have not had difficulties, have been able to stick to the estimated HOA fees? 
Um, that's a good question. Um, I don't know. I didn't wasn't aware that property management companies didn't want to take on a 30 unit. Um, my first go to was going to be the property management company that we're working with on the rental right now because they're familiar with the property and um, they kind of know the sense of what's happening there. Um, we haven't dug into the weeds yet of that, but I think it's, I appreciate you highlighting it. And I think it's something that we can be looking into for sure. Um, in um, terms of the, add to yeah, that well, too. So, you know, we, we walk the tightrope between trying to keep those condo fees as low as possible to make the living situations as, as affordable as possible without running the risk of the condo association getting into trouble. Um, I have had experience and success with an 11 unit condo association um, hiring for professional property management fee uh, services for their early years and then kind of spinning off and self-managing. Um, and I think with this style of condo, Jess, correct me if I'm wrong, people will essentially be responsible for the upkeep of their unit. So it's a zero lot line division. So some of the things like new roofs that a, a different type of structure might have to plan for as a capital repair will actually fall on individual homeowners, for better or worse. Does that answer your question, Calvin? Yes, it adds another asterisk, but that's a future thing. So thank you. Okay. Um, let's see. <laughs> We could, I just want to point out that we've used more time than we thought we would. I think this is really important, but if there's any way to. Yep, but this move is the last one. We should. We are done. <laughs> this is it. So, All right. um, so, timeline. So, 22, 23, uh, we acquired the property. We've done a lot of community engagement. Um, we've been working on site and building design, local funding requests, and we intend to put in our permit request um, within the next month. Um, 2024, we'll be focusing on finalizing our construction documents, getting pricing and bidding, um, submitting applications to grants and foundations, and then any last public subsidy requests with Commonwealth Builders. Um, and then 25, 26, looking at closing on all that construction financing, starting building, marketing lottery, completion, and sales to selected buyers over those two years. So that is everything, I believe and open up to any other questions you might have. I guess I would like to ask, you have asked the trust for $375,000 and one of my questions is when would you need it? Sure, so probably not until 2025 okay. um, when we get into final construction um, financing. Thank you. Paul? Yeah, I just want to make sure that we get a copy of this presentation. Maybe we already have it in our packet. Nope, I can send it to you. Okay, I appreciate I that. I sent the application and the copy of the plans. So um, I will send the PowerPoint. Yep. Yeah, I think people will be interested. It's a great PowerPoint. Thank you for the work. It, it really sure. is very helpful. Sure, feel free to put it on your website if you need to, to mm -hmm. allow others to see it. Not a problem. Thank you. Ashley, this is more a, maybe a question for Dave or Paul, who who might know this. But when we get multiple bids on each project, is twenty percent developers' fee typical, or do you get bids that are below that or above that? And how do you decide? You know, this is a longer question, but is that what you're oh. usually? comfortable with I mean in terms of 20 percent of the the developers fee I, I can respond to that so developers fee is really important developers have to make money this is how they get pay their staff this is how they pay Jessica they pay Laura so having a, a, a developers fee in a project is really important so that project is successful if you don't if you sometimes you see a lower development fee it means you're getting fewer services so we always want to just be transparent in the developer's fee um, so everybody knows what's going on. And there's some restrictions on, I'm sure, I'm not for, for positive, but I assume that there are restrictions on how big the developer's fee can be. But, you know, a developer's fee is, um, it's, it's pains for services that we're getting, like meeting tonight. This is not free, right? These are folks are, who are earning a living doing this work. 
So, so every project, do we know there's a place to look up the developer's fee for each project that we, you know, consider? Is there a place that we could look that up? If it's a bid project that we bid, that would be transparent in that, yes, that the town bids. Any other questions um, or comments or thoughts? I mean, I'm I'm not even sure that we, if the money is not needed until 2025, I don't know, actually, do you need, I should ask, I should ask our presenters, would it be helpful to you to have a vote on this right now? Or can we, can we, you know, I'm seeing Laura shake her head, yes. So, apparently you would get you would then you would be able to say this is more money committed and i know that would help you be able to go exactly. get other money i exactly. believe so we're writing grants and foundations to be able to say that the community is behind this by not only one pot of money cpa but two pots of money that has a huge story to it so so i would um yeah we need to get money committed and locked in early and often the local money is first but i would have a question though about deferring using the money that long. So right now we're paying our pre-development costs with a pre-development loan. Were we to have earlier funds from the from the town, then we could save on the overall project costs by not having to pay as much interest. So we have choices about when we introduce different funds into a, a particular project. Okay. Well, just as information, I would just say, I just look back at our financial statement that we looked at last time, and there was some $500,000 plus in our development fee line, and Nat, Nate did discover that that did not yet include the most recent 225 from the CPA. So that's whatever, somewhere near 725 or something thousand dollars that we have in that pot um just info uh, for information <clears throat> um i would like if someone is willing i'd like to be able to entertain a motion to uh i'd like if we can i'd like to put a motion on the floor and then discuss it uh so if there's someone who's willing to move that we approve this request or not but if there's someone who has a motion to make i'd love to have the discussion after the motion if that's possible um, is any of those hands because somebody wants to make a motion or there's just too many questions? Allegra. Um, I move to use five, no, $375,000 from our development funds line in our housing trust budget to support the Amherst Community Homes project. Thank you. Is there a second? I second it. Thank you. Um, now let's see if we have some discussion now that we have a motion on the floor. Um, I'm gonna just go in the order I see them. Oleg, Ashley. Well, I was gonna ask if we could commit less money or do we have to commit the 375? Like, but that's a longer discussion. And do we have to vote tonight? I think the answer to at least the second one was we don't have to, but it would be helpful to them if we did. So it's not a requirement, but, but it would make the money even more helpful, might make the project cost a little bit less. Um, Paul. Yeah, so I'm very uncomfortable voting tonight. I mean, it's we just heard the presentation tonight. We I have no context in terms of what other proposals might be coming to the trust that might be asking for the same funds? Are there other projects that might uh, be seeking funding? And so just peak doing it right now, I think is premature. And I think we'd certainly want to talk with Nate Malloy about what other things he sees coming down the pike. If we ded if he, if he dedicates all of his funds, a substantial amount of its funds, this is a project we really want. It's a, it's a groundbreaking project. I, I don't want this to be perceived as being not supportive of the project, but I think as from the trust point of view, being, um, you know, understanding the full context of what we are have in front of us, what we want to uh, put our funds towards. Um, and I, I think if we are 
voting tonight or voting in September, I don't think it's going to make a huge amount of difference. I second. Oh, so I'll be voting no on the proposal. <laughs> okay. So. Yeah, uh -huh. Risha. <laughs> um, my question is very related, which was, uh, could we remind ourselves what else is on the docket and where else we might be asking for? But um, I think Paul just indicated that that would be a question for Nate, and maybe that's something we can talk about next month. I second. Okay. Are there other other comments or um, Erica? Oh, I'll defer to Grover first. Grover. I just wanted to say that I appreciate that this proposal has at least twice as many homes on it than the last time we saw the introduction to it. And I think that's valuable. And I think the price point, oh. So I said that Thank the <laughs> proposal, I appreciate that the pro proposal had twice as many homes on it than what uh, was initially talked about the first time that you were looking at it. And the price point for these homes, I think will be a really valuable contribution to our home ownership. Um, and equity goals and have and having a range of incomes um, able to live and have home ownership in the community. So I just want to name that and note that that's a significant jump from what was it like 11 homes on one lot to 30. And I think that's a good thing. So I wanted to say that. And I, I also value all of our members, you know, the motion, I, I could vote on either motion that has been proposed. Um, and I just want to name support and appreciation for what was proposed. And I want to piggyback uh, on Grover's comments. Um, I live in North Amherst and I think that lot is actually very, very um, valuable and glad that um, Valley CDC has uh, gotten that lot because uh, there could have been other developers uh, that could have grabbed that lot and could have made market homes, maybe two or three or four that were 500,000 that they could sell. Um, for I think this is such an important initiative. Um, all of our initiatives have been sort of rental properties, which are important, really important affordable rental properties, but this actually creates home ownership. Uh, and I think it's really, really important. You know, do we wait till September? Um, I just have to, Full disclosure, I won't be here in September. So um, I can wait till September. And you can note that my vote would be yes, um, because I think we're getting a lot for the value that we're putting in. I think the return on our investment is huge, not just with regard to um, those homes, but the ripple effect of having families, families that we want coming into Amherst. So um, I just want to state that. Um, Grover, your hand is still up, or is it just still up? Allegra? Um, so I kind of want to piggyback off of what Erica just said, because I, I was fortunate enough to get to go on the tour at East Gables the other day, and so I think that this is a nice juxtaposition of that property, so we have kind of a rental unit of efficiencies for kind of our lowest income neighbors, and then we have this affordable homeownership opportunity um and it, it it is a higher number that they're asking for but it also seems that it would be able to be leveraging a lot more funding from other sources um and and they're here and they're asking us um and i understand that there are other things in the pipeline and i i don't know if dave was going to talk about some of those things tonight or not um but i i just did a little bit of math and I think without counting the CPA funds that we have that are for um, like consulting services and everything, if the if we gave three hundred and seventy five thousand dollars to Valley to this project with the two twenty five that's not yet added, we would be at four hundred ninety thousand six hundred twenty eight dollars left in our accounts. Um, for other projects that might be coming down the pipeline, which I, I think isn't an insignificant number to have left in our accounts. Um, so 
that's just, those are my two cents. Um, anybody else? I guess I could add my two cents. I, I just, I think that this is a, I can't imagine what is going to make me not want to fund this project by waiting a month or two months or however many months. It feels like an exactly the kind of project that we want. So maybe I am, maybe I'm being overly uh, jumping in too soon or something. But in this case, I don't think so. In this case, it feels to me like I know we want to do this. I don't have a question about it. So I will be voting yes on the proposal that was made to say yes now, because I, anyway, but does anybody else have anything to say before we actually vote, which obviously we need to do. In that case, let's vote. The proposition being to approve the $375,000 requested by Valley CDC for the Amherst Community Homes Project to be paid out sometime that makes sense. I mean, we haven't figured that part out yet, but that we commit the $375,000. That's the proposal. I'm going to go around in the order that I see these pictures on my screen. So Erica, how do you vote? Yes. Carol, I'm next on my screen. I vote yes. Paul? No. Rob? Yes. Grover. Yes. Ashley. No. Risha. Yes. Allegra. Yes. I believe that I heard two no's and the rest yeses. I believe that the motion passes. Thank you all very much. Um, I think I'm, what am I supposed to do now? I'm turning it over to Erica to think about, and thank you very much to our thank you very for your time. Thanks thank for you coming. Guys. Really thank appreciate you. it. Laura's going to stay on and for the rest of the meeting, and I'm going to go Bless deal with my dog. dog. <laughs> Erica is, Laura's going to have walked miles by the time this meeting is over, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Subtle, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> thank you, okay, everybody. So Thank you very much. So we're going to move to town updates. Um, so Nate's not here, but Dave is. Um, so Dave, thank you for joining us. And uh, I hope you had a wonderful vacation. Um, so the first item on the town updates, um, there are sort of a list of things. If you don't have an update, then you know you can just let us know that we'll wait till next next meeting. But if you have one, please uh, share with us. So the first one is the housing planner position. Yeah, I wondered, um, Erica, if you would mind, I kind of have a a flow of maybe updates. Is that okay if I divert That's fine. the agenda right in front of me? But I thought I would start maybe, if you don't mind, with kind of project updates. Absolutely, and, start. Yeah, I just wanted to say, um, you know, to Laura and, and staff at uh, Valley, it's just really impressive to see how that project is moving along. Um, I also, you know, am kind of in awe of the complexity. And I think all of us, you know, you, you kind of need to pause for a moment and really think about the complexity of these projects, the complexity of the funding, the land acquisition, the site assessment, you know, hundreds and hundreds of hours go into these projects. And that's um, at the end of the day, why some of these these costs go, go up and, and we wonder what they are, but you know, as I talk about some of the town projects that we're going to need partners on because we are not uh, affordable housing or market housing developers, we need partners. And those partners are going to go through many of the same steps, almost all of the same steps that Valley went through up there on Pulpit Hill Road and, and Ball Lane. So so very quickly, and again, how, how much time do we have, Eric? I don't know what else you have on your agenda. I just want to be conscious of your time. Because I'm going to be um, with you. I think you want to fold in. Go ahead. I was just going to say, if you want to fold in the VFW request, um, we can try to. I mean, we're at right now 8 to 12. Uh, we have a few things, which is legislative update and the strategic plan process. But I think both okay, could I'll, probably go fast. I can go pretty quickly. My, 
my hope is that we have a little time for Q&A. And again, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to try to be with you. I've met with Erica and Carol, and I'm going to try to be with you as many for as many of the fall meetings as I can. So very quickly, um, ongoing projects. Uh, you all know about East Street School and Belchertown Road, our partnership with Wayfinders. Um, that work is going extremely well. Uh, again, we're, we're so fortunate to have, in addition to Valley, uh, to have Wayfinders in our community and working on another project in the East Village. Right now, we're working on land development agreements and leases. Uh, we're starting to get into site design issues. We're looking pretty, pretty um, closely with, with um, Wayfinders at um, um, some of the wetland challenges, uh, culvert challenges, all the things that uh, Valley looked at up at um, uh, Route 63 and, and Pulpit Hill Road. Um, we're beginning to really, you know, more than beginning to, to kind of peel back those layers and work closely with our partner Wayfinders there. So that project is is moving forward. And I think they're in, in the stages of, of um, their, um, you know, their funding scenarios and reaching out to the state and, and trying to get into the various funding cycles that they need to get into for that project. On the VFW um, property, I think you all know that we took um, uh, ownership of that property a few months ago. We're now into kind of site assessment, full site assessment. Um, we're looking at the building as well as the land. Uh, we already have completed a survey of the property. Um, our our um, facilities department and building department are looking at hazardous material. We're, we're doing an assessment of the of the building itself, as you know, and has been reported, it's a demo. We're not gonna reuse the, the old VFW, but it, uh, in order to remove the VFW building, we need to assess the site to make sure, and the building to make sure that it does not include any uh, hazardous materials. So uh, that work is ongoing right now. Um, we've had informal discussions with some potential development partners and kind of scoped out the really, really broad um, goals of this project, as you know, the goals uh, that that Paul set out for for staff and we've reported to the council are to to create a space for a, a permanent uh, shelter as well as permanent supportive housing. So those are the goals. Those are the broad goals, and um, we've we've had some informal discussions with potential partners, and and there's great interest. The site, as you know, is you know, on the bus line, um, water and sewer, close to downtown, um, uh, highly developable, no wetlands, all of these factors make it, you know, just a prime site for what our goals are for, for achieving there. Um, next steps on VFW, we, um, and I've, I've spoken briefly with Carol and Erica about this, but we um, envision bringing the community together in the fall and winter of 23-24, um, to really help us um, develop some, some, some um, you know, gather information, but also to um, really vision what the site could be in more detail. So those meetings would include, um, we're hoping that the trust would co-sponsor those with us. We'd bring together Craig's Doors, potential partners, stakeholders, um, and in all likelihood, um, those would happen in the fall of um, uh, this year and into the winter. We're also going to bring on an architect to just um, uh, help us come up with some conceptual designs. In other words, what, what could be built there? How many stories? Um, what will the site hold? And I think a lot of that work will be informed by what we come up uh, with in the, in the visioning sessions. We're also, uh, as I mentioned before, preparing the building for demo. Um, we do have ARPA funds allocated for that demo. We don't have a cost estimate there, but just to give you um, kind of a sense of, of magnitude, a demo of a building that size could run anywhere from 75,000 to 150,000, depending on what we find in the building. Hopefully we won't find anything that is more expensive to, to uh, dispose of, um, but we do have ARPA funds for that. And then we have continued to do outreach and included Craig's Doors. Tim McCarthy has been very supportive, the executive director of Craig's Doors, and is very supportive of this project and, of course, will be part of those visioning sessions. And then we've also started to reach out to potential funding sources. We've, we've spoken to staff at DHCD about the project. 
there's there's great support for this, then we need to you know begin to get going on the next steps. The other hope was uh, that we might um, do a site visit um, to some other similar projects around the the, the, the region and, and around the state. Uh, this is not, you know, we're not breaking any new ground here. There are other projects similar to this happening throughout the state. And I think it would be great, perhaps some members of the trust would like to go with staff and visit some of the similar um, uh, sites where they've co-located a shelter and permanent supportive housing. So I'll stop there. That's where we are on the VFW. Um, a lot of this is background work. We have not gone public, if you will, with, with, with any community, um, um, ask for community involvement yet, but that would happen this fall and into the winter. So if you have questions, I'd stop there and, and answer those. Any questions based on what Dave just shared with us? Okay, I'm not seeing, oops, uh, an attendee, just a moment. One attendee, this is John, so we're gonna allow John to speak. Go ahead, John. Um, hi, Dave. Hi, John. Uh, and hi, Laura. Uh, there were two things that were on Nate's list and I don't know if you can speak to those because those would also require money. Um, one is uh, the Strong Street project. Oh yeah, and, I'm those, John. Yeah, I, I hadn't finished. I was just pausing at VFW, but I was going to start going into some of the other on um, pipeline projects. Okay. Um, well, that's what I was curious about. Sure. So, so moving along to some of the projects that are in the pipeline. Um, and again, a lot of this is going to come down to priority. Um, there, you know, we have a finite number of staff and staff hours and resources. So, you know, we certainly will continue to dialogue with the trust. But, um, you know, as a as a manager of a of a, a few departments here in town, um, we have to decide which are the highest priority town properties to move forward on. Um, and you know that'll be part of this process this fall and this winter. But as John mentioned, um, uh, we we have identified some property off of Strong Street. Um, we have done some wetlands work there. We have done some some title work, uh, not fully done with that title work. Um, but the Strong Street property does have some development potential. Um, it is not. I would I would say it is not the easiest property to develop and may not realize the number of units. Again, we're talking, you know, cost benefit here. Um, how many, you know, how much does it cost to develop a site and how many units will um, a, the town slash uh, a partner realize in that project? So Strong Street is of interest to us. We're continuing to move it along. We know the development costs are going to be very high because uh, this is not a frontage lot. Um, it is considerably off um, off the street at Strong Street. So we haven't given up on it by any means, but we're trying to edge this, move this one forward with other projects at the same time. Um, I've mentioned um, at previous meetings the South Amherst School, the South Amherst campus which was uh, most recently used for the alternative high school program uh, for Amherst Regional High School. It is a town owned property. Um, we are just beginning to, to start to look at that um, in the context of what are some of the broader needs for the town. Um, I do know that in that list of broader needs, and we'll talk about um, fire station in a minute, I do know that the South Amherst campus is not an ideal location for a South Amherst fire station. So that is not really under consideration. However, um, at the same time, we're looking at some of these sites. Uh, the town council has asked Paul and Paul has asked me for a review and an update of our surplus property policy. So if we are to look at the South Amherst campus, uh, the old school there, um, that would be in the context of the surplus um, um, property uh, surplus property policy. Um, not to say that um, housing wouldn't be a good fit there. I think there's it's a large lot. It's flat. Um, as far as I know, there are no wetlands on that site. Again, it would be similar to the East Street School. We have a historic 
uh, building and then a more recent addition on the south side. Um, I am not a huge fan of that um, south, as the, the southern edition, the, the 1950s, 60s edition, but I, I would love, if we do anything there, I would love to, uh, um, to preserve the, the historic school if we can. So we're beginning to look at the South, south Amherst School. Hickory Ridge. Dave, yeah. Dave, I just noticed that Allegra's had her hand up for a while, oh, sure. so maybe that's something from a while ago. Um, I was just wondering if Strong Street is within the qualified census tract. Um, I don't have that map right in front of me. I have a feeling it is not, but I don't have that right in front of me. Um, but we'll look at that. We'll look at that. We'll look at that. Um, that's that's fine. Um, moving along to Hickory Ridge, we've been very vi very busy at Hickory Ridge. Um, a, a very a site with great potential, but also a very complex site. But staff has been uh, working diligently to try to um, um, gather information and catalog the information on Hickory Ridge. So just a reminder, the, the property is 150 acres. Um, the first um, part of that project that is underway right now is 26 acres of solar. My staff has been working extremely hard with, uh, with the the company that is developing that solar project, a lot of moving parts just to solar alone. So um, the 26 acres of solar, my hope is that that will be done by June of 24. Um, so we've got solar happening on the site. Uh, as part of that solar project, there, there needs to be 17 acres of mitigation, mitigated habitat for the solar project. We've mapped the wetlands, all the wetlands and resource areas are already mapped on the site. We know where the endangered species are, both on land and in the river. We've, we've completed an ecological restoration plan for the site. We have all the data that we collected through Engage Amherst, which was uh, you know, a participatory process we did in 21, uh, and gathered information on, on the community's interest in seeing all sorts of uses there from affordable housing to zip lines to trails and the list goes on and on. There were dozens and dozens of um, uh, suggestions, recommendations there. So we've done ecological restoration and we've also done some massing studies to see what the developable frontage on uh, West Pomeroy Lane can, um, can hold. And that includes uh, looking at a potential site, and I say potential site, if the town moves forward with a fire station, um, we know we need a, a new fire station uh, to replace the one in downtown. Uh, would we do a fire station at Hickory Ridge? I think that's in the mix. The town council has encouraged Paul and myself to uh, at least look at that, and we are doing that. We're also actively looking at building demo because as you may know, there is a very large clubhouse on that property and that building cannot be reused. And so we, uh, like VFW, we're doing the assessment of that building. We're looking at all of the internal elements to make sure there are no hazardous materials. Um, we bring in specialists to do that. There are companies that do that, contractors. They do a report and that report is part of the demo RFP. So uh, obviously, if you have a building that is that contains no hazardous material, oil, um, uh, uh, any any kind of uh, byproducts of of any um, uh, other uh, manufacturing, uh, asbestos, things like that, the demo cost will be less if if that that report comes clean. So those are all the things we are currently engaged in there. We also got a grant to do a, um, an accessible trail at Hickory Ridge. Um, we are very careful to make sure that that trail does not in any way compromise other uses of the property, particularly the frontage on East um, on West Pomeroy Lane. So um, those are the seven or eight things that we're engaged in. And all of those things are going to come together in a comprehensive plan that we have, um, uh, promise the town council to present to them. My hope is we will do that this fall or winter of 24. So let me stop at Hickory Ridge. I know there are often lots of questions about Hickory Ridge. Um, let quite, me, a, quite a shopping list at Hickory Ridge. 
Sure. Let me ask John before I make my comment. Uh, John, did you have any other comments or questions for Dave in terms of what he just presented? Uh, oops. Am I? Am I? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I, I had a couple of questions. One is, um, given that we have limited funds, so you have the discussion we just had about. Uh, helping Valley Community Development, um, we probably cannot do Strong Street, the VFW, Hickory Ridge, and potential other projects. Um, we probably can only do, in addition to helping Valley, two or three more projects, or one or two more projects, I think. And Strong Street's going to be very expensive, so and there's likely no outside support for that. So I'm wondering at what point do we say it was a good idea, but the pro property is too difficult and too costly to develop. I'm also concerned to hear a little bit more about Hickory Ridge and the amount of acreage on West Pomeroy Lane that could be used for housing. Would you like me to respond, Erica? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, John, um, this is I'm I was smiling a little bit when you said we may not be able to do these projects because you know me quite well, and I you know my, part of my job is to create that pipeline to get or get projects on the tarmac that are going to be ready. I mean, I'm looking at this maybe at a, a little bit longer horizon. I'm looking at this over the next three to could be 12 or 15 years. Um, we need land to partner with folks like Valley CDC and Wayfinders and Home City and others. So um, I think all of these have potential. I, I agree with you, we need to prioritize and that's why Strong Street may be the most challenging of these because of the limited street frontage, wetlands, slope, uh, and a number of other factors there. Um, but it doesn't, for instance, on Strong Street, it doesn't cost us a lot of money to put out an RFP for Strong Street and test the waters to see if anyone would be interested in doing that. So I agree with you, we do need to prioritize. Um, but we, we've got these lands, we, we, um, we, we are not, we're in a position, we're in a unique position where we have these properties that we have owned for quite some time, like South Amherst School, the Strong Street property, more recently Hickory Ridge. We did the same thing, as you know, with um, with uh, the East Street School. So keeping these in play, I don't think we need to rule them out. There's, you know, um, as long as there's not tremendous carrying cost, then ruling them out to me at this point doesn't make a lot of sense. We do need to prioritize. So I'm looking at this at multiple years, multiple rounds of CPA funds um, and state grants. So, um, so the way the way I understood John and and I don't want to speak for John is that I think the trust has to decide where we're going to put our money in terms of what the you know biggest bang for the buck is in terms of affordable housing and that we may not have all the resources so we have to decide and, and choose and yeah i i then for Erica, you're breaking up breaking up a little Erica but I think I got the gist of your question yeah I think it's incumbent upon the staff to make presentations to the trust I also think it's really important to recognize that most of the trust money comes through the CPA process so we're all going to the same well right the town yeah. the trust valley wayfinders so that's one of the you know the important funding sources so I agree that we it's part of the prioritization process that where are we going to get the most units and what are the priorities you know we've talked in this meeting we've talked about how the valleys how valleys project on pulpit hill road is so needed right now because of the you know the owner occupied piece of it and and really ownership piece of it and getting that equity for those future owners and we've done a lot of rental projects we're going to do the wayfinders project 
but how do we look at these pieces of land and say, what do we want to do on those, those properties? And are they conducive, say, to a pro project like Valley's doing out at Pulpit Hill? Some of them may not be. Some of them may really, really work better with a, a rental scenario. So, um, so yeah. So let me just, if I could, with a couple of other updates, um, Paul and I are continuing to have productive conversations with, you know, UMass, with Amherst College and Hampshire College. I know that's been brought up at um, past um, uh, trust meetings, council meetings, and, you know, we really, we just signed, Paul just signed the strategic partnership agreement with the university. Uh, we have a new chancellor at the university. We're very hopeful and optimistic about that relationship. Um, I think some of us have been recently to meetings with Amherst College, and again, with a new president in Amherst College. Uh, the college is, um, uh, uh, you know, holds about a thousand acres of land in Amherst, much of it wet, but some of it developable. So we're, we're hopeful there that we can have some productive conversations with, with the new president and, and his staff. Um, so we'll, those, those things will be ongoing. And then lastly, just you know, quickly on zoning, I'm sure you're all aware, Monday night, the, um, the proposal put forth by the uh, CRC, uh, by, uh, chiefly by um, Mandy Jo um, and, um, and Pat um, was withdrawn. However, as through that process and as part of that process, the, the planning board has really um, recommitted, I would say, to focusing on housing, both market rate housing and affordable housing. And they're committed to a series of meetings this fall and into the winter focused on how can we change our zoning in the most productive and efficient way to increase density. And I think a couple of the areas that they've talked about are one would be the East Village um, down near you know, Cumberland Farms and, and um, other, other businesses down there in the East Village on the way to Belchertown and where our Fort River, our new Fort River School will be. The other area that they've uh, talked about focusing on is University Drive. And so staff in the planning department are very, very supportive of working with the planning, to, uh, planning board to look at those two sites and perhaps others. So I think zoning has the real potential. We've, we've got some, um, some challenges with our zoning that some of those areas just do not allow density to happen. So we want to look at those very carefully. So those are kind of the property updates or land updates. Maybe I pause there for a second and take any questions. Ashley has her hand up. Yeah, I mean, um, I don't know if we've had a real conversation about what is cost effective. And mm -hmm. it does not seem to me that there is a real strategic plan for getting the most units for the lowest cost to help the most amount of people. And so, you know, all these different projects come up and then we vote on them individually. Maybe if we had a year plan, a two year plan with we need to meet 100 or 200 or 300 units in certain categories, how do we do that? We could figure it out. We that's, don't have to just do it one on one. You know, it's like it's always piecemeal. We're just voting on each new thing. Like, what? Why not have a strategic plan? Why not? And we're going to talk about that. Uh, we're really behind, um, but uh, Grove is going to give a report on our next steps for uh, developing a strategic plan in the process. So I'm going to push Dave a little bit to there. There are two things. One is the position that we still don't know when we might see somebody being hired because I think that would be very important both for you and for us in terms of the things that we need such as data, um, knowing the number of affordable house, uh, housing properties, et cetera. And then there's a request from the town that you know if we don't have time, then we can postpone till the next uh, meeting. Sure, um, yeah, and, and if you're running out of time, that's fine. Um, I did wanna just say that you know, the, the document that is driving staff right now is the town council's approved comprehensive housing plan. And that does have numbers in it and it does have goals. So our, um, 
short of any other strategic plans that you develop as the trust, hopefully with the town's participation, that is that is our guiding document. So that's what we are using. That was approved by the town council a year, year and a half ago. And that's what we use every day, every month to try to, to, try to um, prioritize. Um, in terms of the housing planner, um, um, I, I have to first apologize. There has been a little delay in posting that. Our HR department um, has been very short staffed as other, uh, as you all know, that is kind of a, a challenge uh, in the private sector as well as the public sector, um, but they are fully staffed now. I met with the uh, HR director today and one of her staff, and they assured me that that position would be posted. It has not been posted yet. Um, we think we can, can hopefully move that along and have somebody on board. You know, uh, my sense is probably by the end of October is realistic at this point. So that is our timeline for the housing uh, planner. The other question was quickly about um, some associated cost with the VFW uh, project. So um, in short, the town, um, the town can only use ARPA funds for certain things that we're just following federal regulations. And so with a project like the VFW, um, we currently have some, even some carrying costs for the VFW project, um, such as um, we still have electricity to, to the building, things like that. These are fairly small amounts. They might, you know, by, uh, I don't know what Nate forwarded to you, um, but it would be very helpful if the trust supported um, funding some of those costs that we don't have operating funds for and can't use ARPA funds for. So, you know, on the order of $2,500 to $5,000, if the town had a, an amount like that from the trust, we could then use that to pay, for instance, uh, electricity costs until the building is demo. Demoed. I met with our building commissioner today, and he thought the electricity, for instance, would be um, dis uh, disconnected from the building um, by December. So, you know, a cost like that might be, you know, to date, $500, $700, something like that. Um, so that's really what we were looking for is a small amount of money, $2,500 to $5,000 for these funds, for these costs that we can't um, uh, put to ARPA, ARPA, um, use ARPA funding on. Calvin, you have a question uh, related to what Dave just spoke about? Are you asking me? I'm, I, no, no, sorry, it's Calvin. It's, he oh, has his name up. Well, let, uh, after you. Well, going back to something you said, Dave, on Hickory Ridge. Can hardly hear you, Calvin. Oh, I'm sorry, can you hear me now? On Hickory Ridge, how many of the 100 acres remaining are, are realistically developable or accessible from the street? Is it a lot of wetlands there? Or? Uh, yeah, yeah, the site is incredibly wet. It's also encumbered by what's called estimated and priority habitat. These are, you know, it's a very highly ecologically sensitive site. Um, I would say, um, it, in terms of acreage, I'm going to say there are eight or fewer acres on the frontage that are at all developable. I think it's more realistic once you get into setbacks and mitigation for impacts, you know, you might have five or six, but that's probably where you are. The, any of the other, the highest and driest acres other than the frontage um, were taken by, um, by the solar. That's where the solar is going. So 26 acres of solar is across the river, um, but there's five to seven acres on, on the frontage on, uh, on uh, West Pomeroy Lane. Okay, just because of time, I'm gonna move forward. Um, so um, I don't know if we're ready to move on. Um, I know that Nate submitted uh, an email to all of us and what he wrote, I think was between 4,000 and 6,000. Um, and what you're saying is that would be from now till December? No, no, no. I, I think we have some costs at the VFW that we don't have a readily available source of funding for. But if there were, I was scaling that back a little between 2,500 and 5,000 to say, mm -hmm. 
that would be very helpful in partnership with the trust if we had a small fund like that that we could draw from for for um, expenses that you know we don't have a red uh, an easily available source uh, to pay pay those funds or pay those uh, expenses from. So is the trust ready to make a decision about that or should we wait till September and just to think about it? And this can wait until September. Okay, if you don't Let's mind. Wait. Yes. Very good. Thank you. Okay, all right. Thank you, Dave. Um, and I'm sorry, we always seem to be a little rushed, um, but um, we're gonna move to uh, John's um, re recommendation with regards to legislation. And John, let's just say it's quarter to nine and we'd really like not to be here vastly after nine. So tell us what you've got, but quickly, and, please. And you also need to get to Grover too, I understand. Um, two uh, files were sent out regarding uh, things that I thought the trust should consider endorsing that are legislation. The most important one is the state rental voucher program. Um, and basically, everybody probably has some idea about what Section 8 is. That's no longer the right name for it. It's a mobile voucher program that HUD runs. But I don't know how many years ago, the state set up its own voucher program because the federal program really wasn't large enough to meet the need. So we now have a state mobile voucher program. But the program doesn't really exist in law. It's simply something that's appropriated from one year to the next. So as I understand it, the purpose of this legislation is to make sure that the state voucher program uh, becomes a permanent part of the landscape. So it makes sense to me that we would want to endorse it. Uh, and that's the one that called an act codifying the Massachusetts rental voucher program. And I provided the references and links in the uh, material that I sent to you. So that would be one thing to endorse of the things that I included uh, in my first set of recommendations. That's probably the most important. Maybe we should just take the one that is the most important for now and come back next month or something for the others because we do want to hear Grover's report on this on the strategic planning process that we okay. be, began to think about next time so I I you can skip the other two recommendations the I didn't want to leave the bond bill alone we've been talking about money and the bond bill is about money the money and so I think it's important to let our state senator and state rep know that we are behind the bond bill. Um, uh, Wayfinders has led a, a process which pulled together a group of stakeholders around Western Massachusetts. And they did a survey of people trying to find out what the highest prior, uh, priorities are for how the bond bill or how the inside of it like should be structured and i sent you information about that i think again the most important thing is to um send a note or a directive to senator comerford and representative dom saying hey the bond bill is really important that money will help us as well as many other communities in the commonwealth to develop housing in the absence of that money, we have less capacity to do development. I don't mean the housing trust per se, because the money likely won't come to the housing trust because we don't usually manage that kind of money. On the other hand, the people we rely on to do development, um, particularly the not-for-profits that we've been involved with, Wayfinders, Valley Community Development, they really rely on that money in order to be able to move forward. So uh, again, there are a number of programs that were listed in what I sent you. I think the most important thing is to make sure that our state senator and state representative know that we support uh, the bond bill and that we really 
think it's critical to make those funds available for housing development in Amherst as well as everywhere else. I, Comments, I mean, questions? Go ahead, Erica. I was going to move that we go vote ahead. to allow the chairs to write a letter to Senator uh, Comerford and to Representative Dom that uh, we are in uh, support of both the um, legislation to codify the state a voucher program and that we're in support of the bond bill. Second. I second it. Let's vote. Um, let's see. Can we do this? Let's let's just quit. Erica? Yes. Carol? Yes. Paul? Yes. Rob? Yes. Ashley? Yes. Risha? Yes. Allegra? Yes. Grover? Yes. Okay, it passed. Uh, thank you, John. And we are running out of time. I'm gonna, we have like 12 minutes or something till we're at nine. I'm hoping people can give us an extra maybe ten, five or 10 minutes so we can actually have a chance to hear from Grover and whatever else about the process that we're all trying to enter into to help answer some of Ashley's questions about our priorities, our strategic planning process. Go Grover. Great, thanks. So Erica, Carol, and I met to talk about and, and formulate a proposal or a plan to move forward with our strategic planning process, which will get at a agreement between us about really what our priorities are in decision-making as we move forward for the next years ahead of us as the board. And so we, in particular, so we talked about, we heard that people wanted to have a, a blend of in-person and virtual pieces of it. And so, and Erica and Carol, please correct me if I'm misstating anything, but we would propose a process where we all had a couple of in-person sessions where we're talking um, uh, and naming our val, you know, what what is important to us, what are our values, like really coming to an agreement and like building relationships in some ways um, about understanding what our priorities are and also doing some pieces of it on Zoom in meetings. Um, and so that everybody who's on the trust can participate fully, we would like to have an external facilitator come in and help shape our discussion and move us forward towards our goals. And also somebody who has experience in putting together um, housing plans because it's a lot of technical information, right? And, and so somebody who really is able to help us move this forward with some expertise. And Erica had worked with somebody in the past who she thought did a great job from Pioneer Valley Planning Commission and reached out to her, her name, can I give her name, Erica? Yeah, she, she works there and we need to also ask Paul to help us okay, with this. Okay, great. So her name is Catherine Ratt and we are asking, We have. I can, can I email? I don't know. Um, it, Paul could send an email to the executive director of PVPC and request technical assistant from Catherine Ratt. And Rate. Rate, thank you. I and, think. I'll make and she can, um, she, she said that she would provide 15 hours volunteer and then after 15 hours, we would um, use our funds to pay for her services. And also noting that she has worked with the towns of Northampton and Springfield to develop their housing plans. So she's very familiar with the process and um, with a range of options. So that is my report back. And, and I will hand it back to our facilitators to move forward with decision-making. I don't even remember which, am I supposed to be doing this? <laughs> yes. Um, um, <laughs> uh, so 
we did we try i think we talked about also having like a maybe a first and in-person meeting at the end of october or something like that as possible timing thing so just to put that uh, uh, if everything that's obviously got lots of ifs ands and buts there but that was what we thought we would have as a goal to shoot for and maybe uh maybe if not if we haven't talked with paul about any of this maybe we could ask paul if this seems to him to be a feasible thing from the town's point of view and then we'll see if there's any questions or anything else so which piece are you looking about about meeting in person or contracting with P pvpc both okay if the meeting in person we're moving so, uh you continue to meet in zoom or you can meet in person uh we've been in we're not really switched over to in-person meetings yet. We, we haven't really totally set that up. There isn't a hybrid option. So if you meet in person, it's a meeting in person. So, and and I think that that's, me in person makes a big difference for lots of folks. I think we just wanna have it standardized in some way so that the public knows how you're meeting. So they don't come to a meet, they're not signing into Zoom expecting to find you and find out that you're meeting in a room. So just wanting to stand, so I think, but it's definitely a possibility. And I think it's a good thing, especially for this kind of conversation. You want to be in person for that. So we can support that. Um, in terms of Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, you know, I think what you what we'd want to do and we're writing to uh, Kimberly, who's the director there, um, is to sort of be specific about what are what we're asking for the, you know, really scope out what we're requesting, how many hours we think it's going to take. Uh, where the you know if they can offer 15 hours if there's if it's going to take more than that if we're asking them to write a report or something that's a different thing if we want to be clear about what our deliverables are um, with them before we go um, but um, you know I think we should recognize you know if it's sort of I think what what I'm hearing and what I would think would be valuable is to set our prior this the trust priorities because we had we're you're seeing people you know, the trust has money, people are coming in asking for money. Um, we pretty much, as a group, we decided this tonight that the, the Valley project up in North Amherst is a high priority because it's home ownership. It hits all the buttons like that we really value. Um, but we've got other projects that are gonna be coming through the door possibly. And I think we sh it's important for the council, for the uh, trust to say what its values are. So I think having that conversation, um, if it's more detailed than that, if it's like collecting data, we sort of already have a lot of the data. It might be that the housing planner should function in some of that work, um, because if it's data collection, it's really what the the person's going to do is come to our town staff and say, "With where's the data?" So it's yes, not. that's not what we really want to do. But so, um, I, I, think I think we're I think we're looking for somebody to help us uh, to facilitate us in having a. Yeah. Uh, a conversation in person about what we think our priorities should be and to connect them into what the town's housing paul i mean not not yeah. in a vacuum but connected to the yeah. other things that already exist i think that's what we're looking for i think that's really good that'd be really great um grover uh well two points one paul i can't remember if you were at the meeting where we had this conversation but my memory is that, that maybe at our last meeting we talked, or whenever we made the decision to yeah. keep meeting on Zoom, we yeah. talked about meeting our Thursday night meetings, like the consistently, the consistent ones staying on Zoom, but then as needed for these one-off bigger Perfect. things, meeting in person. So Perfect. we can do that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, great. Um, and the second point is that when I said data, I mean more like it would, I think it would be very helpful for our conversation for a facilitator to prepare beforehand and come with just some very high level data of like, here's what, for example, here's what the Community Preservation Act definition of affordable is. And here's what our town of Amherst charter definition is and right, like some of these things that often come up in conversation or here's how many new affordable homes were built in the last five years with this amount of money spent from the trust so that we can have some clear information, shared information that we're all working from, because that seems to always come up in our conversations. That was my hope and the, the reason I said the word data. Mm -hmm. If Can I respond to that? Yes. So I think that that, um, Again, that's not the, the planner isn't going to do that. The planner is going to come to our town staff and say, 
whereas they'll give me information they're going to and so that's going to be a question for Dave if he's going to dedicate his staff time to support that kind of thing really um I, I guess we should think about what's the goal of our of the strategic plan is it to set priorities and then then I think what you're saying Grover is we're going to need some data or some information to help us make those decisions right where where we've already placed our money where are we going to go in the future um, yeah Glover, did you have something else to add there or shall I move on? Well, yeah, I was going to say, I think that information is actually already publicly available from yeah. the documents you've already provided to us. So if they won't do it, I'll do it, but we'll do it. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. I don't, I don't think we need them to do that, but we probably do want some of that. Uh, Risha. Um, so I'm going to have to jump off right after I comment. Uh, apologies, but uh, some of you may know I'm a, a strategic planner in my other life. Uh, and uh, so just to ballpark, I would say you're going to need at least five days of someone's time, uh, probably no more than 10. So, uh, you know, five to $10,000 would be the budget if there were not volunteer time. Um, and just to put that out there as a, like, I don't know when we need to start being competitive and bidding, et cetera, et cetera. But that would be my ballpark for what we're talking about. Thank you. And I'll see Ash you next. Lee. Well, um, you know, the comp I, I would like to know how much like reading the comprehensive housing plan is obviously very useful, but what happens when we vastly exceed that? It's it's pretty low on unit numbers, it's quite low on detail, and I don't think it has much vision. Those are the things <laughs> I'm looking for. So you know, I guess what I'd like to know is what happens when we strategically plan far ahead of the town council. Uh, well, I guess that's part of what we would discuss when we do this. I mean, I I think that we're trying to figure out what are what is the bot. What do we want to do? We want to have some time to be together in order to figure out what we think the priorities of the trust are in the context of what the rest of the town is doing and what the rest of the world is doing and what housing is like in Amherst and elsewhere. So I, th I think that's the task that what you're saying is it's like part of the task. And I don't know that this is a thing that exactly is to be voted on. We voted before that we wanted to do it. This is sort of a report back from the three of us who have been working on it to see if it's, you know, this is what we're thinking about. This is what we're trying to move forward on. This is the vague timeline that we set for ourselves. And what do you think, I guess, is the question more than something else. So, Allegra. Um, I think that it's a good idea. I think that it would make sense to have some external facilitation so that everybody can participate and, you know, Erica and Carol aren't kind of bouncing back and forth and not be able to fully, you know, take in what's being said and say their own um, piece. Um, I guess my question would be like, would we decide on time today? Would we have like a doodle poll at some point in between our meetings so that we're not spending like 20 minutes talking about who can meet when? Um, and just th that yeah, our, this question. I think we just need to get closer. Like we need to have some, uh, we need to have a better idea what we want, somewhat when we want it, what the availability of somebody who can do it with it is, what the availability of a place to do it from the town is, et cetera, or some of those things. And then, okay, here's six options or something, what works, something like that. But yes, I don't want to sit forever trying to figure out which day is best for everybody either. So, um, Dave. I was just going to have your hand up. Did you? Yes. I was just going to respond to Ashley's question. Um, I think it was a really good one. What happens if the trust gets ahead of the town or the town council. Um, I guess I can't speak for the town council, but knowing that report and working on that and many other reports that the town council and select board before then worked on, um, I see that document not as a static document that, but that should change over time. 
And so the priorities in housing, even in the short time I've worked for the town, the priorities have changed, you know, uh, pretty dramatically. So 15 years ago, very few people in, in these conversations were talking about home ownership uh, as a priority. It was all about, you know, more affordable apartments and, you know, um, and, you know, another example would be, um, you know, I'm really interested in senior affordable housing, but we don't talk all that much about it. So I guess I see the, the council's document as a living document that should change over time. And your, your strategic plan would inform that. And the council may look back at theirs and say, hey, it's been two years or three years or however many years, we should update our plan. So I think, I think it's a great question, Ashley. Um, so I guess, I guess, what do we want? I think what we want now is just, is there, are we on the right track? Does anybody think that we should, we should keep working on this? Yes. Yes. <laughs> it, um, okay. I, I really, I think that's all we need from this part of, from this report. And thank you, Grover, for keeping it all in your head or wherever you have it and presenting it for us. Um, so that leaves me to... Erica's wrapping up, well, or whatever is next, Erica, except Paul, do you want to say something? Just, just a quick thing, just, as yeah. you work on this, as you, as you work on this, just think yeah. about it in terms of the request we're making to Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. We would like you to do this so we can do that. And so, so we can think about it in that term. So that's how I will frame it when I write the letter to PVPC requesting the services. So just Great. think about it when you're building this. Okay, then you're, thank you. You're also going to try in the time frame that you're looking at. That will be important to them as well. Thank you. Thank you. That's really helpful, Paul. Okay. Um, so what was on the agenda uh, is um, the East Gable site tour. And I know there was a beautiful picture of Risha and Grover. I think, um, Carol, you were there. Ashley, I'm not sure if you were there or not. Um, okay. Um, but if we can, in a few minutes, anyone who wants to talk about the site visit, uh, anything that you want to share with all of us? For those of you who went. Laura obviously Sorry. was there too, so maybe she has something. <laughs> I was just really impressed by the passive building, you know, all the, the planning that went into that, that it's a fully electric building. The walls are very, very thick. <laughs> Um, and there's a reason for that. So that was really kind of cool to hear and see, you know, all that incorporated into the, to the development. So that was my- Thank you. Thank you, Allegra. And I'm sorry I missed you. You were in the picture. <laughs> Anybody else? And I'm sorry I missed the tour. Well, I would just share that I really appreciated that there were so many units that are going to be affordable to people who have recently experienced homelessness and also that the units were had a high level of accessibility i just think that's really really valuable um there was both wheel wheelchair designed units but also every other unit had flexibility that i think most people need because we all our ability changes so i appreciated that and it was visible throughout Yeah, uh, go ahead. Laura. Go ahead, Laura. That everybody who came promised they'd come back when we finished the building. It's That's right. To share it when it's kind of like undressed like that. But so we, if you just want to pencil into your calendars, we are targeting uh, Friday, September 22nd. Uh, sometime in the early afternoon for our kind of open house ribbon cutting. We, we will for sure get you all emails that goes for town staff who are here as well as um, trust members. You won't miss it. We will tell you many times that it's happening. Um, but that's our that's our goal to get our our certificate of occupancy or, or temp one around September 20th, be able to showcase the property on the 22nd and have people moving in right after that. Um, I met with our property management company today and we have a lot of excited people who are don't have any housing now who are ready to move in and even though the units are small 
it's good because they don't have any things. So we're actually talking a lot about buying furnishings um, because people are coming in really with nothing for some of those units. And even the people who are at 80% AMI, some of them are homeless and living on these people's couches because rents are so high. And that's pretty shocking to me. Um, you know, you, you kind of assume that everybody who's unhoused is going to be really low income, but it is not the case anymore, uh, given the rents that we have. So, Thank you, Laura. And it's not just the rents, it's the first, the last security deposit. Uh, <laughs> utilities can, utilities you know, have gotten out of hand. Yeah. So, yeah. Absolutely. Um, and I hope um, that you also reach out to Amherst College because a lot of the students are really, really great advocates in making sure that the community uh, welcomes this project. So thank you so very much. Um, we are closely in touch with Amherst College who are kindly, I think, going to let us use their parking lot for our event. So it's it's good. Thank you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so uh, announcement, um, you have that on the agenda, CHAPA Regional Housing Meeting on Thursday, October 5th from 10 to 12. Um, if you haven't looked at the CHAPA's web, there's so much information. Breaking up, Erica. Creating housing. Um, oh, probably my internet. Um, can you me? I can't, uh, uh, Erica, can I'm gonna, you're breaking up a lot. So Allegra <laughs> has her hand up and I wanna put out one thing, which is that on the agenda, it says that our next meeting is September 7th or something or other, and it isn't, it's September 14th. So I made a mistake. Please don't make the same mistake in your calendar. And Allegra had her hand up. That was my okay. question. I was like, wait, the seventh is the first Tuesday <laughs> or Thursday. <laughs> Erica pointed that out to me earlier tonight. I just put it the wrong date. So yes, it's the 14th. It's the second, second Thursday as usual. So I'm sorry um, I'm breaking up. It must be the pumpkin turning uh, into a, whatever, into coach or vice versa. Um, we are now at 9.09. So I think um, we've allowed for public comment throughout. Uh, we've been pretty inclusive, um, so I think we can uh, move forward. And um, are there any no, items? No, no. That I, whoops, Ashley, no, did you have any? No, no that's not, I'm, I'm done. Okay, um, I don't think there, if there are any items that are unanticipated within the 48 hours, send it to Carol and me, and we will get it first on the item of the agenda for September. Um, I think 910 is probably the time where we're all just ready to uh, quit for the night. It was a very productive discussion. Um, really, really everyone being engaged. I want to thank everybody for this evening's meeting. And um, unless there's anything else, I don't see any hands up. Um, I'm going to recommend that we go ahead and adjourn. Yes. We are adjourned. We're adjourned. Thank 9, you. 10, we're adjourned. Thank you all. I think I can end it actually. I think you can too. It's just the two of us now. Yeah. <laughs> I have the power. Goodbye. You have the power. You have the power. I mean, I hope we don't we're not violating violating any rules, but I mean 910, come on. <laughs> it's, it's time oh, for it's us. Fine. To we don't we can go other meetings go over for huge amounts oh. of time. Right. So, well they do. But I just minutes, think that's not bad. So I, I think we did great. That. Yeah, I think I think it was a really, really good discussion this evening. One thing that occurred to me was that I don't think I didn't think about this till after we already did the vote, but we have committed some amount of money to hire the person. And I don't know where that shows up in our budget, but that's money that's committed. I think it's coming out of consultants and something yes. or other else than the development yes. money. I agree. Okay. But but yeah. we gotta get that. I would like to see it as a committed thing in the next time that we have a a financial report so we don't forget about it. I just Do you want me to send a message to Nate and ask him to flag for us for September where that yeah. position on okay, I'll do that. Yeah, thanks. Okay. And um and we'll we'll find a time for us and we'll find a time for the three of us on the strategic planning thing again. So Absolutely. Absolutely. Anyway. Great. It was a good Thank meeting. It was, a, it was a great meeting. Thanks, Carol. Yeah, it was a good. Good night. Have a good one.